Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. One of the last sessions of uh, day two of Dreamforce. Hope everyone's having a great Dreamforce so far. Uh, welcome to Maximize Your Apex Performance with Platform Cash. Uh, so my name is Adam Olshansky. I'm a Salesforce developer at YouTube and a Salesforce MVP. Uh, I have over 500 Trailhead badges and 14 certifications. Um, but I'm really passionate about helping people with code and learn to code. And so we're going to be talking about some uh, ways to hopefully improve your code today. Uh, feel free to check me out on Twitter at Adam17AMO. Uh, check out my blog, adamtoarchitect.com. And if you're working on migrating your org to Lightning, I have a Pluralsight course with some tips for that at bit.ly slash lightning migration. Uh, so you've probably seen this slide before this week, just the safe harbor statement. Uh, I don't think we're going to be making any forward-looking statements. But as always, remember, make any Salesforce purchasing decisions based on already available information. All right, so what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we're going to start off just a level set, what is a cache? Uh, from there, we're going to go into specifically, what is the Salesforce platform cache? And then we're going to kind of do a, a demo before and after feature comparison, show what the code looks like running normally, and then what happens when we start using the cache. Uh, we're going to also do a deep dive behind the scenes and see what the cache is doing back there. Uh, we're going to talk about the cache builder interface, an interface available to you to utilize the cache. Uh, as always, uh, with Salesforce features, always things to consider uh, when using them. So we're going to talk about some considerations for the cache. And then we're going to wrap it all up and talk about some next steps uh, after today. All right, so level set, what is a cache? Right? It's essentially this. Squirrels have the right idea. Right? It's this idea of, all right, I may not want to go gather my acorns in the future. So I can gather them now before winter comes, store them all somewhere. And then when winter comes and I'm not able to gather them, I have them immediately. Right? You may be familiar with caching in your web browser. You go to a page, takes a little while to load, gets cached. And then the next time you visit that same page, it loads immediately because the cache is populating it for you instead of having to make a call out to the website to download it. You may also be familiar with this in the Lightning platform. Uh, maybe good or bad experiences with Lightning caching some things for you. You make a field update. That update takes a few refreshes to take effect because Salesforce has cached it for you. Uh, but the idea is cache is a place in memory that you can store values so you don't have to search for them every time you request them. They're accessible when they're needed, on demand, whenever you want to request them. All right, so with that in mind, what options have existed for caching on the Salesforce platform? And there have been a couple of them that have been out there for a while. Uh, a pretty common one has been custom settings. And this idea that, OK, you can create a custom setting, and you can specify exactly what types of fields you want. And you can store it somewhere. When you deploy it across orgs, you then have to recreate, uh, repopulate the data uh, for that custom setting. Um, but it's good if you know exactly what you need uh, for very specific use cases. Uh, same thing with S objects and custom metadata. Right? This is actually metadata that you are committing to Salesforce. And again, very good if you know exactly what you need. Um, you can have an S object you can query. You can have custom metadata you can query. You know the fields. You know the field types. And if you know exactly what you need, it's great, right? but for very specific use cases. And so ultimately, what Salesforce has done is, as I mentioned, they're already doing some caching for you on the platform. And kind of like with custom metadata, they took that metadata and made some of it available for you to create. They're doing the same thing with cache now. They're saying, all right, we're doing all this caching. But you may want to cache something additional. So we're going to give some of that cache to you to allow you to utilize that platform cache as well. All right, so why do we care about this caching? Why is it important to us? All right, and so this is a, a graph I took from a, a Trailhead badge. But I think you can probably surmise similar data when making API calls, for example. The more API calls you make and the more complex they are, the longer it's going to take to make them and return data back. That kind of makes sense. And you see that bar with the red dots uh, with the number one next to it going all the way up. The more complex and the more API calls you're making, the longer it's going to take. Uh, you might also see the number two there in that straight line on the bottom. That's how long it takes for the same query as calling them from the cache, almost instantaneous. And we've seen the same thing when talking about SQL queries. The more SQL queries you make and the more complex your queries, the longer it takes to go to Salesforce, get data back, go to Salesforce again, get more data back. And we see it go up and up, the more queries and the more complexity we have. But once again, we look at line number two, the cache line, almost flat, almost instantaneous. 
And so that's really why we're here to talk about how do we improve our performance, whether it's in Apex or API calls, so we can utilize that cache and don't have to pass on this performance cost to our end users. All right, so there are two different types, uh, two different flavors, if you will, of the Salesforce platform cache. The first one is the org cache, right? These are global values. So I can store some data in the cache, and it's going to be the same for every user in my org. And this data is going to be good for up to 48 hours. So if you think about how caching works, it's a specific, loca uh, specific point in memory for a specific point in time. If I go to a website now that I last went to five years ago, I'm probably not going to want the five-year-old cached version. I'm going to want the most recent version. If I went to the website an hour ago, though, it's probably not going to have changed too much in the last hour. So while we do want the most up-to-date data as often as possible, there is a limit to when the data stops being fresh and stops being relevant. If we're getting old data from the cache, it defeats the purpose of the performance increase if the data is inaccurate. And so for that reason, this org cache, you can use it, but it's going to expire in 48 hours. And so we're going to talk about some ways to repopulate it. The other type of cache is the session cache. And this is the scenario where everyone has their own unique value. So the value you can store in the cache for user A is going to be very different for user B. And this is good for up to eight hours, or as the name specifies, session cache whenever the session for the user ends. So I may need to do the same query in my process five times. I can cache it once, and I don't have to have that performance uh, impact the other four times I'm making that query or making that API call. All right, so again, quick compare and contrast when we talk about org cache versus session cache. Org is going to be the same for everyone. Session cache, unique per user. The org cache is going to expire after 48 hours, and the session cache is going to expire after eight hours or whenever the session ends. The org cache is going to be continuous for all users across sessions for that 48-hour period. And you can uh, manipulate that. That's, those are the defaults, but you can make it a little bit shorter if you want. Uh, some use cases, for example, in org cache, if you have some sort of transit schedule. Right? Your transit schedule is probably not going to change. Right? The train's going to come in 9 a.m. every single day. That's not going to change too often. And if 100 different users are looking up the same exact schedule, there's really no reason to query it 100 different times. You can query it once, store it in the cache, and the rest of the users all get it immediately. Top sales ranking is kind of similar. The top sales rankings probably aren't going to change minute to minute. They'll probably change week to week. But if you're running a report, potentially, or someone's looking at a dashboard and looking up all this data for who are the top sales reps or what are our hottest accounts right now, that's not going to change user to user over the course of a couple hours. Session cache, though, some different scenarios. You talked about a user's shopping cart. The shopping cart for user A is going to be very different for user B. But if I set up a shopping cart, navigate to another page, and then come back to it, I'm going to be very sad if my shopping cart's all gone now. So I may need to save it in the cache so I don't have to repopulate it again as a user. But if you can't share it across your states, that may be OK, as long as it's in the cache and you can easily recall it. Another example might be the distance from a user's location to the customers they're going to visit. So I might log into Salesforce and say, OK, who are the customers I need to visit today? How far away am I? And I can go check that. An hour later, I may have visited the first one, and I need to find out the values for the other two. I can, again, go in and click some buttons and wait for it to calculate all that. Or I can bring that calculation down from the cache, and it'll happen immediately. And the distances and the customers, for me, are going to be very different for the other users in my org. All right, so Salesforce is giving us some of the cash. That's great. How much of this pie are we actually getting? And so uh, as with all things, there's a free tier, and then you can always uh, pay to play, so to speak, for a little bit more. Uh, but unlimited and performance editions are going to come with 30 megabytes out of the box. And enterprise and developer editions are going to come with 10 megabytes if you want to play around. Uh, all others are going to have zero by default. Uh, one other thing to note is because Salesforce is managing this on the back end, it's going to be kind of painful for them if you're creating an infinite number of partitions for this cache. So they have a set limit of uh, a minimum size of five megabytes for each partition you create. And we'll talk about what partitions look like and mean in a minute here. All right, so that's how much of the pie we're getting. All right, so let me go into Salesforce and talk about where we actually find this here. So I'm going to... Uh, Navigate to Salesforce. And I'll make this a little bit bigger here. 
But as you can see, I just uh, went to Platform Cache in the Setup menu, as with most things, and I get a window. And there's a couple different charts on here. One of them just tells me how much of my cache am I using. So I'm in a dev org, so I have 10 megabytes, and I'm currently using none of it. And so it tells me, OK, again, you have 10 megabytes free. And then this one over here says, of your 10 megabytes, what's partitioned to what? So right now, I only have one partition. It's called the account partition. And so that's taking up 100% of my partition allocation at the moment. If I had multiple partitions, they could all appear in this section broken down uh, proportionally. And then if I want to create a new partition, like most things in Salesforce, there's a button to click. So I have the new platform cache partition that I can click. And if I get a better session, uh, we can try creating a new partition again. And then again, we see a pretty common screen in the Salesforce setup menu. I have a label and a name to type in, so I can name it my partition. And the name will auto-populate. I can set it as the default, which I won't do for now because we have a default already. Give it a description if I want. And then it tells me, OK, how much cache do you have left? So I created a 5 megabyte partition already, so I have 5 remaining. If I were to create a new partition uh, for the org cache with 5 megabytes, that's going to auto-update and see, OK, this partition's 5. My total is now 0. Uh, or sorry, that's session cache, rather. If I add some org cache now, uh, we'll see it's not very happy, and it's telling me I went over my allocation, so that's probably not going to save very well. Uh, but if I wanted to, if I didn't already have a partition, I can create a 10 megabyte partition, 5 megabytes for the session cache, 5 megabytes for the org cache. So because we have a partition, I'm going to cancel out of this here. And uh, it put me back in uh, Classic. But if I go back into Platform Cache, uh, I'll see a partition I've already created called the account partition. And that's set to my default partition, and it's 5 megabytes. And if I go in to look at that, uh, we'll see that 0 session cache, 5 megabytes of the org cache for a total allocation of 5. OK. So let's go back into our uh, presentation here. All right, so we saw setup menu. We saw creating a partition. All right. So what's the use case we're going to demo today? So I requested a uh, demo architect org for a little extra space to uh, help demonstrate the, the performance impact here. So I have a gigabyte of space in my dev org here. And I tried to max it out as best I could. I created half a million account records. As you can imagine, the more records you're querying, the bigger your table is, the longer it's going to take to query that table, and the higher your performance impact is going to be. So when you're talking about scales of 1 million, 5 million, 10 million records, it's going to, you can extrapolate accordingly. We're going to be dealing with half a million for our demo here, though. And for these half a million accounts, I want to do two things. One of them is I want to find what are my top 10 accounts by annual revenue, right? Probably not going to change minute to minute. I want to know what my top 10 accounts are, and other users in the org may as well. The other thing I've done is on the standard type field on account, I've added a picklist value called VIP. And I added a new uh, pick list value on account called region. And I just populated that with various regions throughout the United States, Southwest, Northeast, uh, Midwest, and so on. And I want to calculate, OK, how many VIP accounts do I have in each region? Again, probably not something that's going to change uh, minute by minute, at least from a, a scale perspective. All right, so let's, uh, let's go watch the magic happen here. So I'm going to go load up a page that's essentially going to run a SQL query and get uh, my top 10 accounts. So this is just, oops. Let me see where it went here. OK, so it looks like it's loading it on here, even if it's not loading it on my computer. And let's see if we can get this page to load again here. OK. So I got this page to load here, and we see it ran a query, just select uh, some fields from accounts, order by annual revenue descending limit 10. And we see it took about a second, 920 milliseconds. It's not terrible, but you can imagine if I have a million accounts, 5 million accounts, 10 million accounts, it's going to take a little bit longer. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to check my use cache box, and I'm going to refresh this page. 
And I'm going to see my performance went from 920 milliseconds down to one millisecond, instantaneous almost. Let's run it one more time just to make sure it wasn't a fluke. Run our SQL query again. And again, a little bit better, 878 milliseconds. And when I go back to the cache, we got zero milliseconds this time. Again, almost instantaneous. All right, so that's pretty cool. Uh, let's go do our other account here, though. And for this one, I'm going to uh, close out of this first. And let's go to our regional accounts page here. And so if I go to hyperlinks, so this cooperates a little bit better. Uh, we'll go to our regional accounts. And so this just ran a couple SQL queries. Uh, did a schema get describe on the pick list to get all my regions. Did a query for each region. Probably could have optimized the code, but works a little bit better this way for our demo. Uh, but all those values, seven different values, took about two seconds, right? 2,020 milliseconds. And it got me the number of VIP accounts in each of my seven regions. And so once again, I'm going to elect to use the cache, refresh this page, and once again, we see we got down to zero milliseconds. Again, let's uh, double check to make sure we're not having a fluke situation here. 1.8 seconds. Again, not bad, but if you can think about 5 million, 10 million accounts, users probably not going to want to wait 5, 10 seconds, maybe not even 2 seconds for this to load here. And so if we refresh that now, we'll see the query now took, the seven queries rather, now took a combined zero milliseconds. Pretty cool. All right. So I can't promise a 2,000x performance increase every time. You can clearly see the difference between cache and no cache. Uh, running through this demo multiple times, I think I got the caching up to take 19 milliseconds at one point. Uh, that was the highest I could get it. And I can tell you in my org, we have a table of 4.5 million records. Uh, without the cache, it was taking about anywhere from 5 to 7 seconds to query. We started using the cache, and along with all of our calculation, it's now down to about 300 milliseconds. OK. So let me go back into our presentation mode here. All right. So pretty cool. We saw the performance increase in action. What's actually happening behind the scenes, though? All right, let's take a little peek behind the curtain and see how it works. All right. So let's uh, break down this code a little bit. On the top, on the right side here, we see our query. Again, just select from account, uh, order by annual revenue, limit 10. And then we see how we're adding to the cache. And we see right away the cache is actually just a map behind the scenes using a dot put statement. And the key value pair for my map, the key is just whatever I want the key to be named. So we call our partition that we named earlier local partition. And actually, because we made it the default, we don't even have to include the local.account partition if we don't want to. Uh, but local.account partition is the name of the partition and then the key name, top accounts. And then the result of my query, I store as the value in my cache map. On the bottom here on our slide, we have the same method but the cached version. And so all this method does is does a dot get from the map. So first we get the partition, cache.org.getPartition, get our partition we're using. And then we do a dot get on whatever our key name was, which was top accounts. One thing to note. I was caching a list of S objects. I can cache whatever I want. I just have to remember what I was caching and cast it appropriately. So I go into the cache. I tell it, hey, in this partition, I want the value for this key, and it's of this data type. And I have my value. The last thing on here you may notice, though, is this null check. So as I mentioned, the uh, where this went. Uh, the cache can get invalidated for expiration or for a variety of other reasons. Uh, and while obviously it's great when it works perfectly, which is the majority of the time, uh, if for some reason something happens to the cache value, you're not going to want to make the user pay for that. So the performance, increase, or performance improvement you were trying to give them is going to be nullified when they end up getting no data back. So to avoid that, we just do a null check and say, OK, if I got something back from the cache, great. Here you go. I can return immediately, as we saw in our demo. If for some reason something happened to the cache, 
It's unfortunate, but fine. We just return our original method. Uh, in this case, get top 10 accounts, run our SQL query again, recache it, and the next user is going to get to take advantage of that performance improvement immediately. But we make sure that there's no user actually getting no data back. All right, so that was top accounts. Let me see something very similar for our regional accounts here. So I did, again, a schema get describe on the pick list value to get the values from my pick list, iterated over those values, and did a SQL query in a for loop, which normally I recommend against. But again, just demonstrating, I was running seven different queries. I could be querying any number of things. Here I happen to be querying the same thing, doing a count, and creating a map of string to integer, the region name to the count of accounts that were VIP in that region. And I put it in a map, and then I cache the map. So again, we see I can cache anything I want. I can cache a list of S objects. I can cache a map of primitives. I can cache a wrapper class, if I, a wrapper object, if I really want to. Uh, but here we're going to cache accounts by region, our map. We're going to call it VIP accounts. We just remember it was a map of string to integer. And again, down here, uh, here we're doing the both get calls at once. So we get the partition and then do a dot get on the key, casting it appropriately, map a string to integer. Again, we have our null check. If we get a value back, great. Pass it to a wrapper object so my Visual Force page can read it easily. If not, we just return the original method, recalculate it, recache it, and the next user can take advantage of that performance. All right. So that's great. We see what it does for an end user perspective. We see what the code is doing. How do I monitor this from Salesforce? And so let's take a peek under the hood here. And so if I go to uh, my user record, in Salesforce here. Uh, on the user record, there's a permission here called cache diagnostics, which is on the screen there. Okay. And this cache diagnostics permission essentially allows us to look behind the scenes and see what's actually going on in our cache. And so if I go back to our platform cache page here in setup, I was looking at my account partition before. And I see these diagnostics buttons here. Now, I'll only see this if I have that cache diagnostics permission. And so I'm going to load up this page, but the reason why it's uh, kind of restricted by user permission, it takes a lot of system resources. And so not good for a lot of people to have and not good to keep open too long. Uh, but I'm going to go look behind the scenes in our uh, cache partition here. And we see we just cached a couple things. Uh, we see I'm using 0.02 of my, 10, or of my 5 megabytes for this partition. And we see we have two things in here, top accounts and VIP accounts. As you can imagine, my list of S objects has taken up a lot more space than my map of primitives. And we actually see that down here as well. So I can look at the cache contents. And I see we have both top accounts and VIP accounts. As we see, top accounts is almost four times the size of VIP accounts. We see when they were each uh, last accessed, so just a few minutes ago. And we see uh, how many times they were accessed. And we can also, if we don't want one of those values anymore, we can delete them out of the cache diagnostics here, or the cache right from this window as well. All right. And go back to my PowerPoint now. OK. So that's cache diagnostics. We can see what's happening uh, under the hood and behind the scenes. OK. So now I want to talk about the cache builder interface. So we saw uh, the demo. We saw the code. Works great. Uh, check your cache. If it's not there, do a null check. Fine. Requery it. Recache it. Keep going. Uh, but Salesforce said, well, that's OK. We want to actually do that for you, make it a little bit easier. And so uh, Salesforce is doing the work for you. And what they're doing is they're giving you an interface called the cache builder interface. And it's a very basic interface, has one method, one parameter. And it's essentially going to do exactly that. Check the cache to see if the value is there. If it is, return the value. If the value is not there, fine. Requery it, recache it, and then return it to you. And you can request it using the class name and the key name. And so let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, so I have my cache builder interface on the top here. So just account cache implements cache.cachebuilder. And you see one method called do load with an optional string parameter that I'm not using. 
And all it's doing is running my same SQL query as before. Select from account, sort by annual revenue descending, limit 10. And the other thing that it's doing is I'm doing a system.debug statement just so I can identify in my logs when it actually gets called there in line three. So if it gets called, it'll print out running my accounts. If not, it won't print out anything. And if we go to the bottom here, our execute anonymous block, uh, we're going to see lines two and five are the same code. But the first time we run it line two, uh, we're just populating a list of accounts. And we're going to try to retrieve it from the cache. And as I mentioned, the way you retrieve it from the cache using Cache Builder is with the class name and the key name. So it can create a unique key in the cache. So we do cache.org.get, account cache.class, and top 10. We're just going to call the key top 10 for this case. Cast it to whatever we need and pass it down to our variable. And if we look in our uh, debug log here, we see running my accounts from our do load method gets called. And then we see system.debug from the execute anonymous gets called. Size of accounts from query are 10. OK. Let's run the same exact code now in line 5. We run the same exact code, just with a different variable name. And because the cache builder has cached this value, I don't see running my accounts again. I just see my line 6 debug statement. Size of accounts from cache are 10, because Salesforce did the work for us. It didn't have top 10 initially from the account cache class. So it queried it, cached it, returned it. Now it has it. I call it again, and it can just return it immediately because it's already there. And if I go look behind the scenes in the cache builder, or in the cache diagnostics for cache builder, I see something very similar. As you can imagine, it was pairing the class name with the key name. So we see account cache underscore b underscore top 10. No idea why the b is there. But you can clearly see it paired the class name with the key name. And similar to our top accounts we had before, it's a list of s objects. So they're going to be very similar in size there. All right. So cache is great. We saw some great performance improvement. Highly recommend using it. Before you do, always some things to think about, though. So let's walk through some of the cache considerations. All right, so things to keep in mind before using or while using Salesforce Platform Cache. The first one is that we're not actually persisting anything here. We're not actually committing anything to Salesforce. This is all in memory. And so if something happens to that memory, it gets overwritten, it expires, a new value is there, what have you, there could be some data loss. So we need some way to account for that. One other thing that was introduced a few releases ago is the cache always gets invalidated when Apex classes change. And while this can be frustrating, especially when using the cache in a development sandbox and you're constantly changing code, if you think about it, I'm usually caching a value based on some sort of query or calculation. If I deploy new code and change that query or calculation, there's a good chance all my cache values are going to be irrelevant. So, Presumably, at some point, Salesforce will come up with a smart way to figure out where you're caching things and only invalidate when that class gets changed. But for now, whenever Apex classes get deployed, the entire cache is invalidated. So we need to have some way to handle cache misses, one way or another. right? Whether it's the cache builder, whether it's a null check, you have to be doing something to handle when the data isn't there so the user doesn't end up with one of those no good deed goes unpunished scenarios when you tried to give them a performance improvement and they ended up with no data as a result. That's definitely not the scenario you want to be in. Right. As I mentioned, session cache goes up to eight hours or cache lasts up to 48 hours. So at some point, even if everything's coming along smoothly, the cache is going to expire at some point. So one way to get around this, uh, like we saw, is by doing the null check or using Cache Builder. So it'll automatically recalculate for one user. Downside is one user is going to take that performance hit. The other approach is to take the squirrels approach and calculate the values before winter comes, before the users arrive to do the query. So for example, in our org, we have a job that runs every half an hour to update the entire cache. Right? Pretty basic job, just calls the cache, keeps the data fresh. We still have the null check to make sure a user is never going to experience that issue. But at most, if everything crashes, there's not going to be any more than half hour period where the cache is failing. 
And the last thing to keep in mind, 30 megabytes is 30 megabytes, even for unlimited orgs. So while you can purchase more, you have to know how much space you have to store things in memory. So there was a scenario we had. We were trying to you know, query a user's uh, list of records, and there could be up to uh, a million records that could, one way or another, come about in our query. You can't really cache a million records. It doesn't, one, make sense at that point, and two, won't fit in your storage. So while we saw 0.02% of our storage being used with our things we were caching, 30 megabytes is not an unlimited amount, if you think about it. And so there is a limit, so just keep that in mind when you're walking through your use cases for caching. All right, so great things to think about. Let's go uh, do a little recap what we talked about here. So to start off, we talked about cache, part of the memory, complex values can be stored for quick access later, just like the squirrel with his acorns. And we saw a demo about how platform cache can drastically improve Apex performance time, whether it's you know, one query, two queries, API calls. A lot of things can be improved by querying it just one time if it's a similar value for a lot of users. Or in the case of session cache, the same value that needs to be calculated for one user repeatedly. We also talked about how you can store values for a single user or a single session or for the entire org. Our demo worked with the org cache because the top 10 accounts are probably going to be the same for everybody. The number of accounts by region are going to be the same for everybody. Uh, we also saw there aren't any constraints on the data type. If you can cache it, you can cache it. So whether that's a list of S objects, a map of primitives, a collection of wrapper objects of some kind, as long as you remember what that is and can cast it appropriately, you can put it into the platform cache. Uh, we also talked about the need to handle misses and periodically update the cache. So have some way to do a null check and update it, whether it's in real time, whether it's through a scheduled job. There has to be something you're doing to handle that using cache builders and other capability there. The Salesforce is kind of handling some of that for you so you don't have to put the null checks in every single time. All right, so if you're interested in learning more about the platform cache, I actually found out about the platform cache from a trailhead module very appropriately with the picture of a squirrel gathering nuts, uh, but some great examples in there, uh, some of which I took for this presentation. And the other one I'd recommend, as you can imagine, platform cache is going to give you the most bang for your buck when you're dealing with large data volumes. So if I only have 10 accounts in my org, putting them all in the cache probably isn't going to save me that much on performance. If I have half a million, a million, five million, 10 million records in my org for a certain object, I'm going to see a lot bigger performance improvement there. So best practices around large data volumes in general, probably a good one to have as well. Uh, some great resources on the Salesforce developer website also around platform cache. I uh, highly recommend checking those out if you're interested. Walk through some examples uh, similar to the ones we did in the demo today. And uh, this slide deck will be available in the chatter feed on the session page on the Dreamforce website uh, sometime this week. Uh, so with that, thank you very much for coming. Uh, happy to take questions and enjoy the rest of your Dreamforce. <laughs> Yeah, I think there might be microphones around if you have a question also. There's at least one here. OK. <laughs> All right, question? So concurrency issue usually happens when you're updating records, right? So we're not updating anything here. We're just querying them and then storing them. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess there's always the possibility, um, depending on how many users are doing different things. I've never run into that issue um, in terms of like a record being locked for edit uh, if somebody's querying it, if somebody else is editing it at the same time it's being queried. Um, I would think the chances of that would be relatively minor that that would happen at the exact same time. Uh, but again, that's why it's good to have kind of the fail safe, null checks, and things like that, just in case something does happen uh, with the cache failing. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is 
Yeah, so you saw when we were, so the question was, do different namespaces have different cache memories? Uh, so I think it's probably, I, I think the cache is at an org level, but what we saw our partition, for example, was local.account partition, because I was in the local namespace. I forgot to mention that. So if you have a different namespace, you need to namespace the partition accordingly. But I'm pretty sure uh, any namespace in the org would still fall under the org limit uh, for how much memory you have. All right. I think you were first. Here. Um, limit acceptance for our rollback namespace in the cache. Um, I'm not sure if it'll roll it back because it's not actually committing anything. Because um, it's not committing to the database. It's just putting it in memory. So in terms of limit, like on size. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you run a SQL limit, the execution is going to stop altogether then. So it wouldn't get to the point where it would be able to commit any or save anything to the cache. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so the question was, you have 30 megabytes for the org. Can you split it between org and session cache? Yeah, so you saw the, the example I didn't save. If I had 10 megabytes, I could have put five for org, five for session. Uh, I can split it up however I want. In terms of like the session cache, so yeah. So my, my understanding of how the session cache works is it's all mapped to the same key. So the value uh, for your user mapped to the key is going to be different, but I would have to check on that because I'm not sure. I, I would think Salesforce would be smart enough to handle that scenario where it wouldn't take 100 users' session caches and blow the limit. Um, I have not tested that out, though, so I, don't, I, I can't say for certain. Um, but yeah. Uh, here than here. Okay. Yes. Me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like in your demo you have, you have a static uh, structure query. Yeah. So if you make it work so that you can take in parameters, uh, for example, the second user that asks the same question with the same parameters, you get the cache resources. Second user, so second user with the same parameters get the same cache results? Yeah, yeah. So if the SQL is dynamic, the thing is, though, you might want to store it under a different key if it's going to be a different value. So for example, if I'm caching my Midwest accounts, and so you type in, I want the Midwest accounts, somebody else wants the Southwest accounts, you probably wouldn't want to map those values to the same key, because they'd be separate, unique values. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you, 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 you wouldn't want to overwrite yourself, essentially. So if you say, like, org accounts, and you overwrite the Midwest accounts with the Southwest, because the second user got Southwest, if the first person goes back to refresh their page, they're going to get the new value because that key was overwritten. So you cache, for example, a map, then you can keep adding keys to that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, that's probably the better way to do it. All right. Uh, for debugging purposes, can I see other people's session caches? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I would think, as an admin, you should be able to. Um, I haven't played too much with the session cache, but that's a very good question. Uh, so I would imagine if you could, it would show up in the cache diagnostics. Um, but I have not tried it out, so I'm not sure. But I would imagine so. Yes. Um, I yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure. So the question was, uh, I think everybody's pretty close here, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so if, if you have multiple partitions, is it going to take a long time to find the right partition? So I think part of the reason why there is that, I would imagine part of the reason there is that limit of five megabytes per partition is so you only have a certain number of partitions. So for example, the default would be six. Um, so six partitions, I'd imagine, wouldn't be too hard to query. Uh, even if you purchase more, I, I don't know how high you can get up to, but I'm guessing there is going to be some sort of limit on how many partitions there could be. So it's probably better to go more keys per I, I would, yeah, I've, I haven't seen, I haven't had a use case where I've needed more than one partition yet. 
Um, but again, I, I think it probably more than anything I'd imagine relates to different namespaces if you want to keep things separate in a different namespace. Uh, here. Can you cache external objects? I would imagine so, because it's just some data that you're putting into memory, so I, I wouldn't see why not. Um, again, you just have to be able to cast it appropriately. Um, I mean, there's nothing I, against that. You definitely could set the cache values to null. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so the other thing you can do, there's a parameter on the cache. You can set the uh, uh, expiration. So it defaults to 48 hours, but you can make it 12 hours if you want. So I, I would probably recommend that. But you could also do it in a trigger if you wanted. Yes. <laughs> so you said that it has been optimal that uh, while you deploy traffic scores, uh, the caches are getting deployed. Yes. So in a perfect world, it would only relate to the Apex classes. But right now, if you deploy any Apex class, all of the cache is deleted. Yeah, yeah. So theoretically, maybe one day. But right now, any class, the entire cache is gone. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Separate cache for test classes? Uh, I'm not sure. I've been able to write tests using the cache. and. Theoretically, like data, it would be separate, so you wouldn't affect the main org cache memory in your test. Um, I haven't, I don't know how you'd even confirm that, I guess. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, would, I would imagine it would be a different, I would imagine it would be a different cache. But I'm not positive. Yeah, sure. Um, so you can always purchase more, um, but it's 30 megabytes for free, essentially. Yeah. For unlimited, yeah. 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 If what happens? The data has changed? Yeah, so if the data changes, it's probably a good idea to up have some sort of update to the cache also uh, to make sure the users are getting the freshest data possible. My recommendation. Um, so yeah, so kind of like what we did there when we got a null value and had to call our method again, we recalculated it, recached it, and then returned the data. So if a user suffers that performance hit, it's only going to be that one user, and now we have it in the cache for future users. Um, I'm not sure what the parameter in the do load method is used for. I think uh, one of the... Uh, examples from the developer documentation. They put it in their query. Um, I didn't really see a need for it, but it's there if you want to use it. And if not, you can just ignore it. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you all.